Now, we have been talking about uh, grace and favor. We're doing a series on grace and favor. And um, I'm going to uh, continue with that right now. And like I said when I last shared, sometimes truth is explained better through a story. And I'm going to share another story. For some of you, you may have heard me speak about this character before. Um, it's some time since I have. But I want to show you through this person the power of the covenant that you and I have been brought into in Jesus Christ. The position that grace brings you into. And I am believing today that God is going to break off lies of the enemy about yourself, about God and what he's like. He's going to break off shame from people's lives because you know there are people that even can come to know Jesus and still live under shame because they don't know the power, the power of what Jesus did to cut you free and sever you from the past and deliver you and release you into a life of abundant grace and blessing. Amen. God never saved you for you to drag chains of shame with you through life. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. When you come to know Christ, you look just like him before the Father. And I'm going to show you that today. And the person is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Can you say that? Try it. Mephibosheth. Let's say it together. Mephibosheth. So who was Mephibosheth? We're going to look at a few scriptures and then we're going to dive into the truth about his life and what it shows because his story is such a powerful picture of what happened to us, okay? Because we were like him. He was the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, and Saul was king of Israel. You remember Saul was first, and then Saul disappointed God. He rebelled. He didn't obey what the Lord said. And so God raised up David, and eventually, after a lot of conflict and a lot of hullabaloo, David came to the throne of Israel, and he was a man after God's own heart. And we're going to look at a little bit of that story. Now, after David had defeated Goliath, the Philistine, we read in 1 Samuel 16 and 17 how David and Jonathan entered into a covenant together. So Saul's son, Jonathan, had a covenant friendship and relationship with David. The reason being is that Saul's son, Jonathan, even though Jonathan was heir to the throne, he saw the anointing on David. And he recognized that David was the man that God had chosen. And he did an incredible thing. He, he committed to him. And David committed to Jonathan. And they were like this together. Now, David was, uh, became an attendant in the court of Saul. And Jonathan was the king's son and heir to the throne. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Samuel 18. It's, it's important we just get a little bit of the story here rather than just dive straight in. So 1 Samuel 18, when, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul, of, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. And Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him, gave it to David with his armor, even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Okay. So what happened next was that Saul and Jonathan got killed in battle with the Philistines, which is a terrible thing. It was a terrible way to end for Saul. And that's what happened. And it was a time of great conflict and shame. So Saul was killed. And after a, a continued war between the house of Saul and the house of David, David was eventually made king of Israel. Now I want you to turn to the second book of Samuel and chapter 9. Okay, second book of Samuel, chapter 9. 
And we're going to read from verse 1. Now David said, so you've got to understand now, the nation is at peace, conflict has ended, all the war is finished, the civil war is over, peace is reigning, David is on the throne, prosperity is coming to Jerusalem and to Israel, things are going well. But something was niggling David's heart. He couldn't rest easy. And he, one day, and this is after a period, actually, of about 12 years. David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, bear in mind, Saul was out to kill David. Think about this. Saul was his enemy. Saul tried to snuff David out because he was jealous that David was the anointed one. Saul had the position, but David had the anointing. And Saul was jealous, and there was rivalry. He tried to kill him. God looked after David and eventually brought him to the throne. But David is motivated by love, not vengeance. Think about this. And he says, is there someone left of the house of Saul that I can show kindness for the sake of Jonathan? Why? Because he had a covenant with Jonathan. And there was a, a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. I'm sorry, I'm ringing a bit, I'm booming a bit. If we could take this down because I want to raise my voice without you know, getting some feedback. So thank you. There was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him to David, the king said, are you Ziba? He said, at your service. And the king said, is there not someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, yes, there is still a son of Jonathan. He's lame in his feet. So this, the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's in the house of Machia, the son of Amiel in Lodibar. And the king sent and brought him out of the house of Machia, which was far away on the extremity of Israel, on the border of Israel, in obscurity. And, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here is your servant. And David said to him, do not fear. I am going to show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I am going to restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continuously. Whoa! And he bowed himself and he said, what is your servant? that you should look upon such a dead dog as me. And the king said to Ziba, Saul's servant, I've given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants will work the land for him and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Come on. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continuously at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Whoa. Now, I want to just uh, read one more little passage from 2 Samuel 4.4. You don't have to turn to it, but... What happened when um, Saul and Jonathan were killed on Mount um, Gilboa, like I referred to earlier, they were killed and there was great trouble in Israel because the Philistines were running amok and David was still not king. It says this, 
Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up to flee, but as she hurried to leave, he fell. The nurse dropped the boy and he was crippled in his feet from that day on. He was crippled by a fall. That was Mephibosheth. So he was crippled, he was dependent, he was exiled, he was in fear of the king, he was poor, uh, he was, you know, he had a contract on his head. That's Mephibosheth. Now, I want to just put up a little family tree so, so that you get this really clear, you, you know, that sometimes seeing something helps. So if we could just put that slide up, please. Uh, if you've got that one ready of the family tree. There we go. So Saul was the king until he died. Jonathan is his son, and the son of Jonathan is Mephibosheth. And I put David there to show that David and Jonathan had a covenant relationship. And the point is this. That covenant relationship connected Mephibosheth to David. Okay? Understand this. Mephibosheth is now connected to David by the power of covenant. You are connected to God by the covenant that Jesus made in his blood. <laughs> they were not related. There was no blood connection, but there was a covenant connection that superseded, that was more powerful. Everything that worked against Mephibosheth because he was David's enemy was completely reversed by the power of the covenant. And when God put you in Jesus Christ, whatever was going on in your life against you was completely reversed and defeated by the power of the covenant, which is greater than anything else in this world. You are connected to God through Jesus by covenant in the same way Mephibosheth was connected to David through covenant. It completely broke the curse and the line, and every, everything that came down from Saul was broken because of covenant. Wow. Okay. I want you, thank you, back to me. I want you, <laughs> I want to show you how Mephibosheth is like you and me. Number one, he's a child of royalty. You see, theology does not begin with sin. It, begin, it doesn't begin with the fall. It begins with creation. You were created with nobility, dominion. You are sons and daughters by creation of God. He knew what he's doing. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You are of noble birth. You are of noble origin. Hallelujah. It's really important to know that because life, the world, that experience can tell you you're rubbish. There's even theology that tells you you're rubbish. But you're not. You're born in the image and likeness of God. You have nobility in you. And sin did not have the power to destroy that. Hallelujah. You're a child of royalty. Don't forget it. God is your father. You may be far away from him right now. You may not know him, but God loves you. And he sent Jesus. He does not pay the biggest price for some kind of refuse and scum. He gave his best because he wants his kids back. Amen? So number one, a child of royalty. Number two, just like Mephibosheth, we're crippled by a fall. You see, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God and ate of the fruit, a 
and turned their backs on their father and went their own way, we call it the fall. And the fall didn't just separate men and women from God, it crippled us. You understand what I'm saying? You see it everywhere. Men and women are crippled because of the fall. Sin doesn't just, in some theoretical way, you know, just distance us from God. It destroys us. You only have to lift up your eyes, read the newspaper, you know, smell the coffee, have a look what's going on in society to see people are lost and broken and confused. God, they don't even know who they are. They don't even know if they're a man or a woman any longer. I mean, how confused you can get. You know, ducks and geese have more sense than men and women these days. People don't know who they are. You know, everybody who comes to this church has a story. A story of brokenness. A story of hurt. A story of messing up. A story of of making mistakes. You know, we carry shame and guilt and brokenness. Let's not dress this up. Society is crippled because of sin. We're born of nobility, but crippled through a fall. The third thing is this, we, just like Mephibosheth, living in shame and obscurity and fear, disinherited. You know, he was, he was afraid of David. David could have got out and killed him. After all, he's the grandson of Saul. He's a threat to him. So what's Mephibosheth going to do? He can't, he can't even walk. He can't ride a horse. He's, he's being looked after by the kindness of this man in his home, just given food and, and shelter and hidden. He's being hidden. If people find out who he is, find out where he is, someone's, someone's going to get him because he's from Saul's line. You know, people, people are afraid of God and that's understandable because the Bible says that we are enemies of God outside of Jesus. Because we're in rebellion against him. We turned our back on him. We went our own way. Instead of God's good way, we went our own way. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Remember that you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in this world. Outside of Jesus Christ, we can't make it on our own. We don't have what we need. You know, I've heard people, I talk to people about the Lord. I talked to loads of people yesterday. Very interesting. You know, there's a lot of believers out there. There is. There's a lot of believers out there. I spoke to six young men walking down Dudley Street, one after another. Six. Every one. I went up to, hi, you know, God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. Are you a believer? And, you know, three of them said, yeah, of course I am, man. Oh, I, I like you believe in Jesus. Yeah. Have you given your life to him? Sure. Do you go to church? Nah. Disconnected believers. There's a lot of believers out there. Don't, you know, don't uh, believe what you think. It's, it's, the gospel is impacting you, and you just have to go and talk to people. And a lot of people, if they're not believers, they have a connection I prayed with one lady whose daughter is being witnessed to by a friend. She has a Bible in her bedroom. This mother is like really impressed with what's going on. I said, well, look, now I meet you and I'm telling you about Jesus and your daughter is is hearing about Jesus. Don't you think God's saying something to you? Do you mind if I pray for you? She was really happy for me to pray with her. Just another God connection on her journey. So people, you know, they're really open, but they're lost. You know the name Lodibar, where Mephibosheth was hanging out, where he was hiding? The name Lodibar means no pasture, no word, no communication. It's not a good place to be. Outside of Jesus, it's not a good place. It, it, you know, you may think you're doing fine, but inside you're empty and, and, and hurting. But we try and keep up a bravado, you know, put on a mask, but inside, these people that look so brave and confident, they go home and they're lonely and they're hurting. 
The next thing is this. He was remembered because of a covenant. David said, is there, is there someone, anybody that I can show kindness to for the sake of Jonathan? Because the covenant that he had with Jonathan, he, David just wanted to do good. You know, he just wanted to love somebody because of that covenant. And that's the heart of God. You know, here's Mephibosheth in fear of the king. And he doesn't realize the king is thinking, I just want to do good. I just want to love those people. I, I just want to do them good. There are so many lies told about God. There's so many, and no wonder people don't believe in him because it's not the God I know. It's some caricature. Let me tell you, God is not angry. He's not trying to defeat you. He's not looking for ways to trip you up. He's not petty and vengeful and spiteful. He's your heavenly father. And even in your anger and rebellion and confusion, he loves you. And he's just trying to think of some way to reach you. Any way he can. How can I do good? How can I do good to them? And God says this about us because of Jesus. And we are already provided for in Christ. Our disgrace and our shame makes no difference. God is moved by an overwhelming desire to do you good. And then how about this? We have been fetched by the Holy Spirit. David said, who is there? And he called this servant, Ziba. He said, Ziba, who do you know that's left? And Ziba said, well, there's, there's Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. David says, Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, great. Let's go fetch him. Now I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine, here is Mephibosheth, every day he wakes up and he's living in fear and hunger and dependency on this, this guy, Amiel, and, and, and he doesn't know whether he's going to last another week. But now one day he wakes up and he hears in the distance the sound of horses' hooves. And the noise he's been dreading has come at last. That's it. He thinks, my, I'm, I'm, it's over. That's it. Somebody has grasped on me. They're coming to get me, and I deserve death. And the sound gets louder. There's a whole squad of David's soldiers galloping to this house. They come nearer. The sound doesn't go by. He knows this is it. Don't worry, it'll all be over real quick. One swipe of the sword, I'll be summarily executed and it'll all be over. The soldiers dismount. Is there someone called Mephibosheth lodging here? Well, he can't lie, so they bring Mephibosheth out and he can, you know, barely contain his, himself. His heart is pumping and his dreading what's coming next. But to his... <laughs> to his utter astonishment, instead of being thrust to the ground and killed with a sword, he's lifted up and placed on a horse in front of one of these big guys and taken back to Jerusalem. He's confused. He can't understand this. What's going on? I know, David wants to mock me. He wants to draw this out a while. Perhaps put me on trial, throw me into a dungeon, perhaps torture me. I don't know, but this is looking worse than I feared. Then he comes before David himself, and he's like bowing, and he says, what am I? I'm just a dead dog before you. But the amazing thing is, his first experience of the king blows every lie he had ever been told about the king. He can't believe what he's hearing. I'm going to restore to you, Mephibosheth, I'm going to give you everything that was lost to your father. You are going to get it back. I'm going to make sure all your servants are fed, all your land is restored, all your flocks are restored, but you... You're not going to live back there at home. No, I've got something better for you. You are going to eat at my table. 
you're going to live with me in the palace and every need you have is going to be covered and taken care of. Wow. Rescued, restored, and honored all because of a covenant. You remember I told you the dif difference between mercy and grace? Mercy means I don't get what I deserve. Grace means I do get what I don't deserve. This is a picture of grace. Mercy would have been like, okay, Mephibosheth, we'll let you off, just so you know, but don't cause trouble. But here is a complete reversal of the whole situation of his life. He's brought into the king's palace. And uh, David says this in 2 Samuel 9, verse 7, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, said David, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, and you will always eat at my table. You know, that's what the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit went and fetched us. You know, the Holy Spirit is fetching people today. You might be sat there listening to me or watching online, and, and suddenly your eyes are being opened to the, the truth, the power, the reality of the gospel for the first time. That's the Holy Spirit is showing you the love of God. You say, I don't deserve it. No. God doesn't love us because we deserve it. He loves us because he loves us. That's all you can say. He loves you because he loves you. Because he loves you. He's invited to take his place at the table of the king and everything would be provided for and taken care of. And he's given the status of a son. You know, when you are brought into the Father's house, God looks at you just the way he looks at Jesus. He sees no difference. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. I want to read to you, when I, when I came across this, it was so powerful. It's a little quote from uh, Charles Swindle's book, uh, I think it's um, about grace. I, I can't remember the title of it, but it's um, amazing. He describes what it was like for Mephibosheth, and he paints a picture of dinner time at David's table, okay? So I want you to enter into this now. I want you to imagine what Charles Swindle is saying now as he paints the picture of what it must have been like for Mephibosheth to actually eat at the king's table. The dinner bell rings through the king's palace, and David comes to the head of the table and sits down. In a few moments, Ammon, clever, crafty Ammon, sits to the left of David. Lovely and gracious Tamar, a charming and beautiful daughter, arrives and sits next to Ammon. Then, across the way, Solomon walks slowly from his study. Precocious, brilliant, preoccupied Solomon. Handsome, winsome, Absalom, with beautiful flowing hair, black as a raven, down to his shoulders, comes next and sits down. That particular evening, Joab, the courageous warrior and David's commander of the troops, has been invited to dinner. Muscular, bronze Joab, is seated near the king. Then they wait. They hear the shuffling of feet, the clump, clump, clump of the crutches as Mephibosheth rather awkwardly finds his place at the table and slips into his seat and the tablecloth covers his feet. I ask you, did Mephibosheth understand grace? Because when you and I are brought to the king's table, it doesn't matter what crippled you. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter what shame you have carried in your life. When you 
are pulled up to the king's table, the tablecloth covers it all. You look just like Jesus. You're a son and daughter. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. Your sins are washed away. You know when your sins are washed away, your guilt is taken care of. Your shame is removed. God has no plan to remind you of your shame. It's under the blood. Everything is dealt with. You know, this, it's time to deal with shame. It's time to pour all that stuff behind you and realize you are a child of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You are nobility. You are restored. You are loved. You are precious. Huh. My God. God wants to do you good for Jesus' sake. Grace transforms you and elevates you to the status of a son. You eat at the king's table. Let me just conclude really quickly and then we'll pray. This grace, right, is established by covenant. It's all based on what Jesus did through his blood. You may be thinking of yourself as unworthy. You may see yourself like a dog, as a dog like Mephibosheth. I've messed up my side of the covenant, but the covenant is not dependent on your merits or labors or works. It's already settled in Christ through his blood. God has provided in Jesus for every failure of mine already. You know that? I'm not defined by my failures. I'm defined by the blood of Jesus and the covenant he's brought me into. Failure is under the blood. Sin is under the blood. Hallelujah. God promised Jesus that he would be the first among many sons. It was received by faith. You enter into it by faith. David didn't see the crippled feet or the groveling form of Mephibosheth. He longed to express covenant love. He was constrained to give and give, and that's what God is like. And finally, it's enjoyed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in, and the first thing he does is tell you, you're a child of God. He says, Abba, Father. It's that intimate word, Abba. You are loved, called, chosen, indwelt by the spirit of adoption. We have a living guarantee of God's presence and provision. We don't try and repay anything. We live in grace and we live from a place of grace. Hallelujah. Come on. Praise you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want you to stand in the, in the presence of the Lord as we finish. And I want to speak to anybody today who has not yet given your life to Jesus. Maybe you now understand what it's all about, what God wants to bring you into because of what Jesus did. My friend, today is the day. Don't let guilt, sin, shame, or anything prevent you from making the most important decision of your life. Don't go out of those doors until you've settled your salvation, you've settled your eternal life in prayer right now before God. And I want to give you an opportunity to pray the prayer and commit your life to Jesus. Are you ready to do that? I want you to close your eyes and I want you to just put your hands out in front of you and let's seal this today. The most important thing you could ever do to ask Christ into your life, to let the Holy Spirit fetch you, receive the offer, go to the palace, be loved by your Father. Be adopted through the covenant that Jesus made in his blood. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you will seal this day, that people will come to know you and they'll receive Christ into their heart, that you will be their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to pray that prayer together, and I urge you to say it good and loud from your heart. And if it's the first time you've ever prayed this prayer, then God will hear that. 
and he will receive you. So let's pray it together. Repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the power of the salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, giving your life, shedding your blood so that I could know the Father, be forgiven of my sins, and have peace with God. I come to you today, and I receive your salvation. Take away my sin. I believe on the name of Jesus with all my heart, and I commit my life to you. Thank you that you hear me. Thank you that you receive me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now just keep your eyes closed for a moment. Just in your own heart, thank him. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for receiving me. Thank you for loving me. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now while, while our eyes are just closed, if there's, if there's, whoever in here said that prayer for the first time, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to lift your hand up so I can see. Show me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, there's, there's somebody over there to my left. God bless you. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? There's, there's someone here down to my right. God bless you. Anybody else? This is your moment to put your hand up and indicate somebody at the back there. Praise the Lord in the middle. I see you. Thank you. God bless you. I'm just going to wait a moment more in case there's anybody else. If you prayed that prayer for the first time. Give me a wave. Let me see your hand. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Oh, somebody else over there. God bless you. I see you there. Thank you. And another one over here to my right. God bless you. At least four people have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That is absolutely wonderful. We give praise to God. Now, um, you, you guys, you guys, I'm going to ask you to do something very brave for me, grab the hand of the person that you came to church with or the, whoever came with, grab your hand and you just come down to the front here right now without delay. Come quickly, come down the front. We want to receive and bless you and pray for you and we want to welcome you. Come on, don't be shy. Jesus gave his life for you. This is your time to say, I give my life to Jesus. God bless you. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Come, come quickly. That's it. Well done. God bless you. Anybody else? That's absolutely wonderful. Now, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We're going to pray for you. We have people that are going to pray for you, give you literature, and bless you. If there's anyone else, you can join them. We have a ministry time open now. We are here to pray for you and bless you. God wants to break shame off your life. God wants to give you a breakthrough. There's somebody else coming. Isn't that wonderful? This is a day of salvation. We give God praise. So we are going to, we're going to enjoy a, a, a time in giving God the glory and the praise and enjoying his presence. The ministry time is open. We're going to pray for these people. If you're watching online or the live stream on the catch-up, you can give us a message, phone the office or email. Let us know that you've given your life to Jesus today. Amen.